So Numbers. I love this book. You guys, you guys digging on this book? I want to hear an amen. amen. All right, better. So God's Word rocks, and Numbers is a book that is rarely taught. And as we've been seeing so far through the book of Numbers, there's so many things we can learn. And a better name for the book of Numbers, now while the, every verse and every word and every jot and every tittle in the Bible is inspired by God and there's not an error in it, sometimes the names that they gave to the books of the Bible could be a little better. And one, Numbers, and when you see Numbers, you think, what do you think? It's a, like a calculus book in here, or what? You think you're just going to look at a bunch of formulas? No, Numbers is really about the time where they're wandering in the wilderness. And the sad part about it is that as they wander, they forget. As they wander, they're missing out on God's highest. It's been said, you know, that we can have a saved soul and a wasted life. When they were delivered out of bondage in Egypt, God brought them out out of 430 years of crying out to God for deliverance. And now he's taking them into the land of promise. And this 11-day journey is going to turn into a 40-year death march because of their disobedience. And a lot of Christians, that's our life. We've been saved, but we've never entered into all that God has for us. Amen? We've been satisfied to have a saved soul, but a life that does not experience all that God has. Tell the message, submitting to the authority of God. Because one of the biggest problems and the biggest struggles most people in the world have, and boy, are we seeing it today, here's what it is. Submitting to authority. Do people like to submit to authority? Right now we've got people that don't want to submit to police. They don't want to submit to any, and they certainly don't want to submit to God. Amen? And we're going to see that there's nothing new under the sun in tonight's text. Because even though God had shown himself so mightily and so powerfully in their presence, they still were not willing to fully surrender their lives. Here's our, here's our flesh. Nobody tells me what to do. Anybody ever said that before besides me? You're not telling me what, who does that guy is think he is telling me what to do? Nobody tells me, I'm my own man, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's our flesh. That's our flesh, amen? You know what the Spirit does? We submit. Humble yourself on the side of the Lord, and He will lift you up. <coughs> One of the most popular stickers in Santa Cruz, shocker, where I came from, was question authority. Question authority. And that's exactly what's happening when we get to Numbers 15. Numbers 15, they are doubting, they are questioning, they are murmuring, they're complaining, they're crying, they're unsatisfied. <coughs> and as Christians, can I encourage all of us? I've said this many times to you, and I need to say it to myself again. We have nothing to complain about. Amen. Amen? Are we going to heaven? What's the answer? Yes. Okay, guys, we're going to heaven. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We're new creations in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? But sadly, we can fall into the trap of murmuring and complaining like the world does. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, God has been nothing but faithful to the children of Israel. And He has brought them out of bondage, as we said, in Egypt. He heard their cries and mercifully sent them a deliverer. So he took them out of that place where they were beaten. Took them out of that place where they were surrounded by idolatry. And he rescued them. How did he do it? How did he show his power? He showed his power through the plagues. Through the plagues he showed his power to turn water into blood. Turn all their water into blood. To, to bring lice and to bring flies. And then eventually with the Passover... He killed the firstborn of every household where the blood of the lamb was not in the shape of a cross, where the angel of death would pass over. He showed himself in the pillar of fire, that the pillar of fire would lead them everywhere they went, or the cloud by day and the fire by night that would lead and guide and direct them. He gave them the law up on Mount Sinai. Moses comes down and he's glowing from being in the presence of God. They heard the voice of God. From Mount Sinai speak audibly. And when they heard his voice, they were so afraid. They said, you go talk to him because we don't even want to be in his presence. They were so fearful of his power and in awe of him. They dwelt in his presence because they built the tabernacle and everything in it pointed to Jesus Christ. Points to God and points to Jesus Christ in particular. They encamped, they were encamped in a cross. If you were here at Numbers 3, everywhere they moved, they were encamping in the shape of a cross with no idea that thousands of years later, that's how the, the redemption would come through the cross of Calvary. He's revealing His power. He's revealing His grace. He's revealing uh, just the awe and reverence they should have for Him. He's revealing Himself in daily provision. He's dropping you know, donuts out of the sky. 
Manna, it says it's oil-filled pastry. It sounds like Krispy Kreme to me, right? And he's dropping this stuff out of the sky, and he's feeding them this, you know, pastry that's good for them, that's sustaining them. God is doing everything. He's delivered them. He's blessed them. He's empowered them. His hands upon them. He's, he's walking before them. He's speaking directly to them. He's feeding them. He's watching over them. He delivered them through the Red Sea, the same Red Sea where he delivered them. He brought judgment to Egypt. Boy, you would think there'd be some people pretty fired up about God right about now. You'd think they just couldn't stop praising him right about now. But here's what happens to them. It can happen to us. All that God has done for us can grow common. All that God has done for us can be something that we cease to be in awe of. And that's what happens. And soon... Their temporary praise quickly becomes murmuring, quickly becomes complaining and questioning God. If you were here last week, remember what they said? Let's let's go back to Egypt. They want to go back, go back to Egypt. Well, we had leeks and onions in Egypt. Uh, You know, I want to go back to Egypt. Uh, How about the beatings in Egypt? How about, the, how about the enslavement in Egypt? How about the idolatry in Egypt? And by the way, you're not getting back, back, back through the Red Sea this time on your own. Amen? But they have this mentality that to go back to the old way of life. And that's a temptation we can have when we become born-again Christians. And then all of a sudden things don't go exactly the way we want them to go. And maybe we pray a prayer and God doesn't answer it the way that we want. Or maybe we go through a difficult relationship. Or we get an illness. Or there's some trial in our life. And then all of a sudden, because God's not doing what we want the way that we want Him to do it. We say, well, I'm just going to go back to my old way of life. That's what the enemy wants us to do. And I promise you. There's nothing back there that compares to the one that we know here. Amen? Amen. There's nothing back there. And, the, and your past will lie to you. You'll, you'll have fond memories of what's back there. You'll remember the party and you'll forget the hangover. Amen? Amen? You'll remember all the things that were, quote, good, and you'll forget all the tragedies that came from living that sinful life. So that's where we are as we come to chapter 15. As they had responded in disobedience. They were defying the word of God. They had questioned um, the leadership that God had put in power. And now, because of their disobedience, when God told them to go into the land of promise, what did they do? They sent spies into the land. And people often say, oh, I'm going to go spy out the land. I think, you know what? Biblically, theologically, spying out the land is weak. Amen? Amen? You know why? Because God already told them to go into the land. Amen? Spying out the land is, well, let me go check and make sure that God was right. Amen? I'm going to put a fleece out before God. That, too, is weak. If God's already told you what to do, we don't test God. We trust God and we obey God. Amen? And too often, oh, I'm being really spiritual. I've had people do, well, I'm just putting out a fleece before God. Really, bro? You don't trust him? Well, I didn't say that. Well, yeah, you did. You're putting a fleece out when God already told you what to do. Here's what happens. They send the spies into the land. And guess what? Twelve come back. Two? Yeah, we'll go kill them. Just as God said, they're carrying grapes the size of bowling balls. They come back. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Everything God said is true. But the ten spies go, oh, they'll wipe us out. We were hoping when we went into the land, we'd find a bunch of three-foot-tall people who couldn't fight with no, you know, with no defense. And instead, they found fortresses and giants in the land. And because of that, they didn't trust God's word. And they, they put their focus on their circumstances instead of putting their focus on their Savior, on Almighty God. Amen? And we can do the same thing. When do we get discouraged? When we're looking at our circumstances and we're forgetting about God. Amen? What my son's going through right now has been such a great lesson for my whole family because either we trust God or we don't. Either God knows what he's doing or he doesn't. And we trust him. Amen? Amen. So here they are. They listen to the ten spies and because of it, God says, okay, you're not going to go on the land of promise. You're going to miss out. Everybody 20 years of age and above is going to die in the wilderness. Oh, you want to go back to the wilderness? Good enough. Here you go. Spend the rest of your life there. You want to go back to Egypt? We'll just leave you in the wilderness. You don't trust me? Okay, miss out on God's highest. 
You'll never see the land flowing with milk and honey. There would only be two people above the age of 20 that would. And it was the two spies, Jacob, Joshua and Caleb, who had gone into the land and who had trusted God. So that brings us to this morning's, or this evening's text. If you got your outline, let's go through it quickly. Submitting to the authority of God's word, God's instructions to the next generation. So now that this generation is going to die, God's going to give instructions to the generation that's coming. He's going to prepare them for taking that place that their parents wouldn't. And I want to tell you something. If you're here tonight and you didn't have godly parents, if you didn't, and, and I, right now I'll tell you what, we have a generation coming behind us that needs some godly instruction. Amen? I know we have a few millennials in the room. You know what the reputation is for millennials? What is it? Entitled and lazy. Is that not true? Entitled and lazy. The world owes me everything. And here's the reality. That, and you know what? The generation in front of mine probably thought something similar about us. Amen? But the reality is that this generation now are going to be the one that God's going to use to go into the land of promise. So he's going to spend the same 40 years while he's bringing judgment to also bring about preparation for the next generation. While God is, no suffering is wasted, no trial is wasted. While judgment is coming to some, preparation is coming to others. And that's what we're going to see tonight. First of all, he's going to reestablish the sacrifices. You know why? Because for 40 years... After God established the sacrificial system, they made zero sacrifices. None. They're t carrying the tabernacle with them everywhere they go, but they're not using it. They just completely shut down on God. They were out of fellowship with God. They were wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. They were missing out on intimacy with God and all of it because they refused to trust the word of God when he told them to go into the land of promise. Let me make it really clear for all of us. If your life is dry, it's not God's fault, it's yours. It's mine. Amen? If I'm not as close to God as I used to be, who moved? It wasn't God, it was me. And the reason that we go through struggles in life is we don't trust the word of God. If we will trust the word of God, we will boldly and aggressively and, and, and you know, relentlessly be faithful to what God has commanded us to do, no matter what the circumstances are. Amen? There's, though there's giants in the land, we'll never be afraid because our God is greater. So we're going to see the reestablishing of the sacrifices, and then we'll go through each of those. Then we're going to see the righteous judgment against rebellion. Do you know that judgment is righteous? Amen? There's right and there's wrong. Contrary to what our world may say, everything's, black, everything's gray, there's no right or wrong, and everybody's got whatever I feel. And you know what? The Word of God is the exact opposite of that. What God says is right and what everybody else says is wrong. Amen? And the Word of God is the authority, and He's the one we follow, and He's the one we obey. And if the world contradicts the Word of God, the world is wrong. And I don't care if everyone votes for it. God's Word is is always right. We're going to see two types of sin that God brings judgment upon, sin done on purpose, and then the violating the Sabbath. We'll talk about why that's important. And then finally, he's going to cause them to remember the law and the commandments. We need to be reminded again and again and again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word, the Word of God. That's the theme verse. If you, if you listen to our radio program, it's called Faith Comes by Hearing. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you want more faith, spend more time in God's Word. It's that simple. So let's begin there in verse 1. Submitting to the authority of God's Word. And we're going to look at the reestablishing of the sacrificial system. Why is the sacrificial system so important? Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness for sin. I shared with you a few weeks ago when my car was... Uh, a guy T-boned me, and I went to pick up my car, and I started having a discussion with the guy who fixes cars. God allowed my car to get smashed so I could talk to this gentleman for three hours. And he's a Jewish man, and he was debating me on Jesus. And we had a very good conversation. It was very respectful, but it was also very, I believe, fruitful. We're going to have some more conversations. But as I was talking to him, he's like, I have to keep 613 laws. Because I said, how are you getting to heaven, bro? I have to keep 613 laws. I said, how are you doing on that program? How's it working out for you? Keeping them all? Oh. 
No. I said, okay. And he said, you're Gentile. You only have to keep seven. I said, well, whatever they are, I'm not keeping them. So, <laughs> amen. I know I failed. How many sinners we got in the room? Amen. So here's the reality. One of the great things I was able to talk to him about was, so you're Jewish, a Jewish man, you keep to the law. I said, so when was the last time you had a burnt offering? I'm not talking when your wife, you know, lets the, leaves the food in the oven too long. I'm talking about when was the last time you had a burnt offering? When was the last time you had a sin offering? When was the last time you actually made sacrifices? Where's the Ark of the Covenant? Guys, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness for sin. And so he's going to reestablish the sacrificial system because all the sacrifices point to, to Jesus. Every one of them. Let's just begin there in verse 1. Look what it says. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you have come into the land, you are to inhabit, which I am giving you. When you come into the land, and you make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, a sacrifice, to fulfill a vow, or as a freewill offering, or in your appointed feast, to make a sweet aroma to the Lord from the herd and the flock, then he will present his offering to the Lord, shall bring a grain offering of one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour with one-fourth a hen of oil. Here's what's going on. He lets them know when they go into the land of promise, they must not forget the sacrificial system. The next generation is, needs to not follow in the footpath of the people, their parents that went before them. Do you know during that 40 years, if you have three million people wandering through the wilderness for 40 years, and everyone above the age of 20 is going to drop dead. For 40 years, they would march, 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 and people were dropping dead every day. That generation was passing in front of them, and they saw what happened. Can you imagine if you were 18 years old, and you were waiting outside the land of promise, and then the spies went in, and then they came back, and, be, and everybody got afraid, and you heard God's judgment coming upon your parents and upon everyone over the age of 20. And God's through Moses saying that they're all going to drop dead in the wilderness. And then you spend the next 40 years walking through the wilderness, watching people drop dead because they disobeyed the word of God. You think you might want to obey the word of God? Amen. Amen. You had a constant visual in front of you every, every waking moment, every single day, as an entire generation passed away. And so now he's saying, guys, when you go into the land, when you go into the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey, don't you forget about the sacrificial system. Because those sacrifices point to Jesus. Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness for sin. When is the first time you see the shedding of blood in the Bible? Where is it? Where? Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. And why does it happen? There you go. Adam and Eve choose to sin. They, they, then they recognize their nakedness before God. They're convicted over their sin. So they cover themselves up with fig leaves. And then God goes out and kills an animal. Nothing had ever died. And he covers them up. Because the first time we see the shedding of blood is for the covering of sin. Amen? All the, all the shedding of blood, all the sacrifices are pointing to the fact that we are sinners in desperate need of a Savior. And so they had for, stopped making sacrifices. They were living their life apart from a need for redemption, living life apart from conviction. And now he says, when you go into the land of promise, you're going to go back and remember that covenant between you and the Lord. You're going to remember the shedding of blood. When you come into the land, contrary to what many modern day psychologists might say you're responsible for your own actions amen okay your parents blew it but when you go into the land you're going to make the sacrifices and too often we want to blame every action on a disease i, I yeah i'm a sex addict that's my, you're a fornicator amen I'm an alcohol. It's just it's a disease I have, guys. It's sin. It's a choice. Quit taking away the responsibility and putting it on something that it's not. Amen. We want to take away our responsibility, and this is exactly what happened to that generation. They all die in the wilderness. So now this generation is being told in the very beginning, the first words to them: You're going to go back and reestablish the sacrificial system because that was God's plan. 
all along. Notice that we're neither condemned by our father's sins nor are we saved by their righteousness. And this promise was given to Abraham that he was going to bless all the nations of the earth through his children and through his descendants. And the way that that has to start is the reestablishing of the sacrificial system. So 40 years it had been ignored. They probably had to go get Leviticus out to know what they were supposed to do. Everybody died. There's nobody, who's going to tell, to go, what does it say? What did Moses write down? So the first one is uh, uh, the burnt offering. An offering by fire. It's not an offering if it doesn't cost something. And a true sacrifice costs something. Each offering reveals man's need for atonement, while at the same time revealing the attributes of our coming Savior. So the burnt offering, the entire sacrifice was consumed, all of it. And when they would bring that and place it upon the altar, the bronze laver, they'd take it and they would sacrifice it, it would be completely consumed. It points to the fact that our Savior surrendered His life fully to the Father, and it also points to the cross of Calvary because the bronze lab, or the bronze altar had four points. And they would take the burnt offering and they would tie it down in all four places. Just as our Savior bled from four places. And then they would tie it down and they would, burn, and they would sacrifice it. And the Bible says that even though it was a burnt offering, it was a sweet smelling aroma in the presence of God. And what I love about that, first of all, God loves the smell of barbecue. Thank you, God. Amen. So when next time you're out in your backyard and you smell that, God loves that too. Amen. But what he loves about it really is the fact that it points to his son and the one who would come and restore sinful men and women like us back to holy God. And so this burnt offering was a sweet smelling aroma. And it was a reminder that the sacrifice had to be made. A perfect innocent male given freely before the Lord to pay the price for those who are deserving of punishment. That's a picture of the cross. Amen? Do you know one of the things they would do with a burnt offering is they would put their hand upon it and they would confess their sins over it because it's a, it, they were saying, this animal represents me. And so now I put my hand upon this animal and now they take the animal after doing that and they slit its throat. And that's gnarly. Amen? Aren't you glad we're not in the Old Covenant? Amen. Aren't you glad we're not dragging lambs in here? Thank you, Lord. But the reason was they were to never forget that there's a high price for redeeming sin. Amen. It was a bloody mess. You would never. Can you imagine the first time your children saw it? You bring the lamb into your house. You have it for four days. You bring it in for Passover time. And now the blood is and, they, they, you know, they're getting attached to that lamb. And now they watch it die. And it died. Why? Because I'm a sinner. Again, all of this is pointing to Jesus. And then the priest would collect the blood in a basin. They would offer it to God because without the shedding of innocent blood, there can be no atonement for sin. As you came near the door of the tabernacle where God's presence was, there was blood everywhere. It's a bloody mess. Aren't you glad that when Jesus died on the cross, he said it's finished, amen? And it's paid in full to Talestai. And that, you know, in the... At the Last Supper, he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for many for the remission of sins. So we don't need any more old covenant blood because the blood of bulls and goats cannot redeem sinners. But what it does is it shows our need for redemption. And it was pushing sins forward, in a sense, toward the Messiah who was coming. Amen? Constant reminder. And so they were going to begin by reestablishing the sacrificial system. And it would start with the burnt offering. And again, the altar is such a, a clear picture of the cross. These burnt offerings could be bulls or an ox, a beast of burden, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It could be a lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It could be a goat. You guys have seen this. Remember the story of, of uh, Abraham and Isaac? And Isaac's carrying the wood up, up the mountain, the same mountain where Jesus was crucified. And he gets up to the top, and you know, before he gets to he says, Dad, we have the wood, and, but where's the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? And he says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And what does he find caught in the thicket? A goat, a ram. 
And he pulls the ram out. And it's interesting that, you know, part of that burnt offering could be two. Or they would have a, an animal, one, where they would sacrifice it. And the other one, they would confess their sins over it and set it free. And that's where the term scapegoat comes from. All the sins were confessed over it, and they would send it as far as the east is from the west, carrying your sins away. Guys, that's what our Savior did for us. And all these sacrifices needed to remain in place to remind men, remind women, that they needed to be redeemed. That they needed to be forgiven. That they were sinners in need of a Savior. Amen? And so they had to reestablish that. And this is how it began. The notice it says there in verses 4 through 12, we saw the burnt offering, now the grain and drink offerings. And it's interesting... That we saw there through verse 4, this fine flour. And the flour, you know, they would bake a cake in a sense and they would make this sacrifice with it. But isn't it interesting, we're going to see a sacrifice of, of grain, but also a sacrifice of a drink. And, and basically what you have is bread and wine. What's that a picture of? It's communion. The Lord's Supper. Amen. His body broken and His blood shed. And so as they're making these sacrifices, they didn't, there's no way they could have fully grasped all that it pointed to. But if they obeyed God, they were pointing to it nonetheless. And sometimes we don't fully grasp why God allows us to go through the trials or why we're in the situations that we're in sometimes. But guys, what we need to do is even when we don't understand, we need to trust God anyway. Amen? And obey Him anyway. Though He slay me, yet will I trust to Him. And bringing flour and oil and wine to the sacrifice, the worshiper was bringing the Lord the first fruits of his labor and evidence of God's goodness and provision. When they went into the land of promise, they would harvest it, and some of that very first part of that harvest of the grapes and the, and the harvest of the grain, and that would be the first thing they would then give to the Lord. Guys, we don't give God the rest, we give Him the best that we have. He should be the first one we think about, not the last one we think about. And so the sacrificial system is in place and the grain and drink offerings bread and wine of communion and they point to the cross again each element pointing to the lord look at verse five and one fourth of a hen of wine as a drink offering you shall prepare with the burnt offering of the sacrifice for each lamb or of the ram you shall prepare of the grain offering two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one third of a hen of oil oil in the, in the bible represents the holy spirit so here you have this grain that's sifted, sifted is also a word for beaten. And our, you know, it's a picture of the body of our Savior. His body was broken, his body was beaten, and again, mixed with oil, the Holy Spirit. You take the, the juice, the wine, again, the blood of Christ. All of this is pointing to our Savior in such a clear, clear way. The Bible tells us in Isaiah. 53, speaking of the Messiah, that he will be poured out, he will be poured out, his soul, he poured out his soul unto death. He's being poured out. And this is a picture that we see in every aspect of these sacrifices. They're all pointing to the Lord. It says in verse 8, And when you prepare a young bull as a burnt offering or as a sacrifice to fulfill a vow, or as a peace offering to the Lord, then he shall be offered with a young bull, a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah, of fine flour mixed with a half hen of oil, and you shall bring it as a drink offering, half a hen of wine as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Thus it shall be done for each young bull, for each ram, for each lamb or young goat, according to the number that you prepare, so you shall do with everyone according to to their number guys when we look at the word of god and we sometimes will read things like this that we don't fully grasp all that it means we don't have to we just need to obey amen now we want to pray lord help me to fully understand but i don't wait till i understand fully understand to obey i just obey amen the Bible says to submit to the authorities God's placed over you. Well, I don't like that guy. Well, guess what? It's not submission if you like him. Amen? It's just hanging out with your friend or whatever, right? I mean, well, I'll submit to people that are really nice to me. That's not submission. That's just doing what you want. Submission takes place when it's a situation that's difficult and it's, you've got a boss that's a jerk or you've got somebody that's an authority in your life of some kind that mistreats you and you submit to them anyway so that God will be glorified. So that, to point people to the Savior. God's Word is the standard. 
And we need to obey him no matter what. And he's saying, look, with every sacrifice, I want you to bring the first fruits with you. Yes, the blood of the bulls and goats, the shedding of blood, for the shedding of blood, there's remission of sin. But also, I want you to bring the bread and I want you to bring the wine because all that points to Jesus as well. Amen? Verses 13 through 16, I want you to see it's the same sacrifice for everyone. Look what it says there. All who are native born shall do these things in this manner, in presenting an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And if a stranger dwells with you, whoever is among you throughout your generations, and would present an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord, just as you do, so shall you do. One ordinance shall be for you of the assembly and for the stranger who dwells with you. An ordinance forever throughout your generations as you shall as you are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. One law and one custom shall be for you, for the stranger who dwells with you. Guys, there's only one way God said to get to heaven, and Jesus is the only way. Amen. Amen? And you'll notice that it's not just the sacrificial system and all the things that point to Jesus for, for the Jews, and it's something else for these people and someone else for these people. I'll never forget years ago, uh, when I first started working for the company I've been with now 28 years, uh, you know, I have a full-time job, and I was doing some sales training, and I was going to all the offices, and one of the guys found out at the time I was a youth pastor, and he said, he, went, he invited me over for dinner, I was uh, out of town uh, doing some training, and when he invited me over, he says, I got some questions for you, and I want to show you a few things. He was a lot older than me. So he takes me out into the garage at the end of the meal, and he takes out these books, and he's got all these religious books. And he said, okay, in America, he put the Bible down. And in Israel, you know, he put down the, you know, the old the, the law and the covenants. And then over here, he put down the writings of Confucius. And over here, he, wrote, he put down the Buddha. And over here, he put down Muhammad. And over here, and he said, look, are you too stupid to understand that it could be different ways for different people to reach them according to their culture? And I was a young man then, so you think I'm pretty bold now. I said, because he asked me if I was too dumb to understand. I said, are you, too, are you stupid enough to think that 2 plus 2 can be 4, or 8, or 9, or 11, or 17, or 25? Because Jesus said, it is appointed for a man once to live, and then to die, and then the judgment. Muhammad was the prophet of the sword who said the Messiah is only going to come with the death of all the infidels, and he never died on the cross for anybody. Hinduism teaches reincarnation, and you're going to be reincarnated based on how good you live your life. Uh, uh, the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah. You go around, the, and they're all contradicting each other. Guys, you can't all contradict each other and all be true. Amen? And so, this is the point being made here is, anyone who is among you, they're not bringing their idolatry with them. You know, somebody, you know, some people left Egypt with the Israelites, right? They saw the power. They're like, dude, I'm, out. I'm going with these guys. That's a good call. Amen. And some came with them. And they didn't bring, you know, if they brought Molech with them or they brought, you know, Aphrodite, any of their gods with them. No, if you're here and you come into the land of promise, this is the only sacrifice that is acceptable. And anybody who's with you, they make the same sacrifice as you do. Because Jesus is the way for everyone. Amen. Not just some people. And it's not based on your culture or your background. It's based on the truth. The sacrifice, whether you're an Egyptian, an Edomite, or an Israelite, the sacrifice was the same. One law, one authority, one way, one truth, one sacrifice. And it didn't make exceptions for your culture, your background, your ethnicity. It all had to follow the same law. There's one law. There's one truth. Pastor, you're so narrow. You know what I like about you Christians? You're narrow. Two plus two is four. If that makes me narrow, then I'm narrow. Amen? The truth is the truth. It goes all the way back to the very beginning. Political correctness says there's different standards for different people. Political correctness is wrong. The word of God is right. Amen? It's not what people think. It's not what people feel. Have your feelings ever lied to you? Amen? Word of God is true. And here he says, whoever is among you, the sacrifice is the same. If they've come out of Egypt, they too will sacrifice the lamb. If they've come, they, will, they too will make a burnt offering. They too will make a, a, a first fruits offering. They will do the same that you do. 
if they're going to dwell among you. But you know what? I see this not as exclusive, but inclusive. Here's what it means. That anyone who's willing to come through Jesus Christ, no matter what their background is, we're all one. Amen? We're all one. Anybody who comes through Jesus Christ becomes a part of the family. Amen? And there's no tears of who belongs and who doesn't. It, we all come the same way. We've all been adopted into the same family. So while some people see it as exclusive, I think what it is is inclusive because Jesus died for the whole world. And he desires that none should perish, no, not one. And if we will come by the blood of the Lamb of God, we too, all of us, can be redeemed. Amen? I think, I'm so thankful for God's grace. Verses 17 through 21, here's... The heave offering or the wave offering as it is called. It says there, let each of you take a censer and put incense in it. And each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each of you with this censer. So every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregate. Whoa, Did I, sk I skipped right over, didn't I? See what happens? Somebody catch me when I do that. He says, you shall be a strange. One law, one custom shall be for you in the strange. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I bring you, then you will eat of the bread of the land that you shall offer up a heave offering to the Lord. You shall offer a up a cake of the first ground meal as you heave it before the Lord. Heave offering to the, of the threshing floor. So you shall offer it up. Of the first of the ground meal, you shall give to the Lord a heave offering throughout your generations. What does this mean? All this, here's what it means. Guys, we don't just make the sacrifices, but what we want to always do is remember God first. So when they would have sacrifices, they would take the very first part of, any, of that meal that they made, the very first part of the harvest that they made, and they would come before the Lord and they would wave it before Him. And it was just a, a, a reminder that, Lord, the very first fruits of everything I have is yours. I think the problem that we all can have is when we forget to make God the priority in our lives. We somehow think it's us and we should get some of the glory. Somehow we think it's our hard work. Guys, we give Him all the glory. And as a constant reminder, it was not only the burnt offering, not only the grain offering, not only the drink offering, but was this wave offering where they physically would go out and wave it before the Lord and say, Lord, the first of what I have belongs to you. So along with this heave or offering, this first fruits, offering the first fruits to the labor to the Lord, finally, we see the sacrifices of repentance and restoration. And these are the ones that are so important that we never lose sight of. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. If we lose sight of the cross, if we lose sight of our sin and our desperate need for a Savior, then we'll just become a religious country club. We'll just become a bunch of people that come here and hang out together. Guys, I've had pastors tell me, well, I, I think that's the wrong word, but I've had people that claim to be pastors, when I pastor in Santa Cruz, say, well, I don't think, you know, the resurrection is not even that important. You know, the cross isn't that big a deal. You know, Jesus just came to show us how to live. No, he came to show us how to live, but raw, he really came was to die that we might have eternal life. And so we have this picture that the wave offering was to make sure people didn't lose sight of who was most important. And now these, new, these next two offerings are to remind us that we're all sinners in desperate need of a Savior. Now these next seven verses, he's going to talk about unintentional sin. Have you ever heard of that? When you sin, but you're not necessarily, you know, plotting to sin. I don't know about you. I know pretty much when I'm sinning. How about you? Amen? Matter of fact, I usually know before I sin that I'm about to sin, and God's trying to stop me from sinning, and I choose to sin anyway. Am I the only one that ever does that? Amen? He's putting stop signs up in front of me. Don't say it. I know you think it's funny, but it's not nice. Don't, 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 and then you say it. And then as soon as the words get out of your mouth, you get the Holy Spirit head slap. Amen. Conviction of the Holy Spirit. And then hopefully you repent. And the mark of a, someone growing spiritually is the time between when you sin and when you repent gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Amen. But this first, these next seven verses talk about unintentional sins. What does that mean exactly? Sin done in ignorance, without premeditation. They can be sins of commission or omission. Look what it says. If you sin unintentionally, and do not observe all these commandments which the Lord has spoken to you. All the Lord has commanded you, verse 23, from the hand of Moses. 
from the day of the Lord gave commandment onward throughout your generation? Then it will be, if you unintentionally committed, without the knowledge of the congregation, the whole congregation shall offer one young bull as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma to the Lord, with its grain offering and its drink offering according to the ordinance, and one kid of goats as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the whole congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it was unintentional that they should bring their offering uh, made by fire to the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for the unintended sin. It shall be forgiven the whole congregation of the children of Israel, and the stranger who dwells among them, because all the people did it unintentionally. I'll try to think of a good example of an unintentional sin. But a couple points I want to make here. First of all, can you not, you're driving down the freeway. You're talking to a friend. This has happened to me. The last two tickets I've got, it's been many years, but uh, both were the same thing. I'm driving along the speed limit 65. You're on the freeway, and then they drop the speed limit. And you're too busy talking to your friend, or I'm listening to music, or I'm doing what I'm doing. And all of a sudden, a light goes on, and they pull you over, and they go, you know what the speed limit was? Yeah, it was 65. Well, actually... About a quarter mile back, it changed to 45. Was I speeding? What's the answer? Did I know I was speeding? Was I, was I wrong? Guys, here's one of the points. What about the person that doesn't know they're sinning? Is it still sin? Yes. Amen? Now, God is a gracious God and a loving God and a merciful God, but I want us to notice that it's sin whether you know it's sin or not. Amen? So whenever we do something contrary to the word of God or the will of God, well, I've had people say, well, the more I read the Bible, the more accountable I am. You're already accountable for the whole Bible before you ever read it. Amen? You're accountable to God if you never read it. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Guys, so this unintentional sin still required a sacrifice. Because whether it's sin of forethought that's done in bitterness and anger, or it's something that was done unintentionally, sin is still sin. And if, let me remind you again, sin is an archery term between perfection and where your arrow lands. And that word is separation. So however far away you land from perfection, you're a sinner. Whether you miss it by an inch, and none of us is that close, or 10,000 miles, and we might not be that close. Amen? But the point is, we've been separated from God. And so whether we did it on purpose, or we did it in ignorance, there still needs to be a sacrifice. Amen? And he says, so as a provision for unintentional sin, they would make a sacrifice for the whole congregation, knowing that this was something prevalent throughout the people. But God wanted to make an example and have a reminder to them always that no sin should ever be taken lightly, even the sin I didn't do on purpose. Amen? No sin should ever be taken lightly. I just told a little white lie. Do you know that half a truth is a whole lie? Amen? Anything I do contrary to the word of God requires the shedding of blood for there to be forgiveness. Amen? And this, quote, unintentional sin, is, and it can be a sin of omission. Do you know you can sin by saying nothing? Amen? You can sin by doing nothing. The one who knows to do right and does not do it is a sinner. Amen? If the Holy Spirit convicts me to do something, and I make a conscious choice, yeah, I'm going to let that go. I'm in sin because I've disobeyed God and his word and his command in my life. Amen. And so, guys, so I can, I didn't sin today. I just sit in a room. You know what? Maybe the, you, the sin, you didn't fulfill the great commission that day. Amen. You didn't go out and do what God has called us to do. God brought you an opportunity. There's some things we don't need to pray about. And one of them is obeying God and going out and fulfilling his word. Amen. In Leviticus, the focus here is on holiness and walking in right fellowship with God. And the emphasis of this sin offering is that all sin, even those committed in ignorance or without forethought, are still sin and require repentance and sacrifice to produce restoration. Our God is perfect. He's perfect, He's holy, He's righteous, He's just, and He's true. And He cannot have sin in His presence or He's got earth part two. Amen? One sin in heaven, and we've got earth all over again. So there can be no sin in heaven. But we're all sinners. So how do we get to heaven? Our sin must be wiped away. Amen? And that can only happen 
through the perfect sacrifice, the holy perfect sacrifice of our Savior. Muhammad, even if he had been crucified, which he wasn't, and even if he had risen from the dead, which he couldn't, he could not die for you because he's a sinner. Amen? So he's got his own problem. He can't take care of my problem. He's got his own problem. I'm, I'm a million dollars in debt. A guy who's $10 million in debt isn't bailing me out. He's got his own problem. Amen? And guys, only the Lord can redeem sinners like us. And so even when our sin is unintentional, it must never be taken lightly. And I'm, and I'm really grieves the heart of God that we dial down sin and we give it fancy names. It's not adultery anymore. It's an affair. Having an affair. Catered affair. No, you know what I mean? And, and we dumb down sin and we make it less... And it grieves the heart of God. Sin must be taken seriously. Do you think, look at, again, I'm not a political guy. You guys know that. Politics makes me sick because it's the biggest bunch of liars I've ever seen. Amen? And they're all getting caught lying and nobody cares. Got caught 874 lies in this video. Well, I'm improving. I mean, what? I don't understand. And everybody looks away from it because of this moral relativism, and we don't take sin seriously. And I'll tell you the sin that I take most seriously, the sin in my life. Amen? It grips me. I hate, I hate it. It grieves me. It drives me to my knees. Our God is a righteous God with a righteous standard, and His standard is not based on the opinions of men or our level of understanding. Sin is sin, whether... We know it or not, and Jesus is the standard against which we all fall painfully short. If we compare ourselves, we can only find someone worse than you. Amen? It's not that hard. But we don't compare ourselves to Osama bin Laden or Adolf Hitler or someone in ISIS. We compare ourselves to Jesus. And how are we doing? Not too good. This unintentional sin requires... A sacrifice and the nation sinned so a young bull for a burnt offering entirely consumed plus the required grain offerings were poured out to restore sinful men and women back to a holy God it says there in verse 27 and if a person sins unintentionally then he shall bring a female goat in his first year as a sin offering so the priest shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally when he sins unintentionally before the Lord to make atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally for him who is native born among the children of Israel and for the stranger who dwells among them so not only did they have a sacrifice for the whole nation each individual brought a sacrifice as well for their unintentional sins. You know what? We need a sacrifice for our nation right about now. And what I mean by that, we need repentance. I mean, the price has been paid, it's finished. But we want to sing God bless America. How about America bless God? How about we repent before God? We want to mock God, curse God, reject God, uh, use His name as a cuss word, uh, take Him out of our public schools, take Him out of our city square, remove Him from everything. People are trying to get in God we trust off our money. Everything's offensive to everybody out there who doesn't believe in God. And then we expect God to bless our country when we mock Him and curse Him and rebel against Him and want nothing to do with Him. Lord, help us. Amen? We're the salt and light. Help us to point people to the truth. There's individual responsibility to repent for our sins, even if they're sins that we did unintentionally. It's interesting that the priest would apply the blood to the four horns of the altar, like the points of the cross, and the rest of the blood was poured out in the place of sacrifice, and the best portion was sacrificed upon the altar, and the remainder of the con of the uh, carcass was carried outside the camp. Guys, if you've been to Israel, to where Jesus was crucified, you go outside the city gates, and it's outside the camp where Jesus was crucified. It's outside the city. On, a, on what would have been a busy thoroughfare that day. He didn't die on a wall in front of some candles. He died on a cross on a busy street. A busy thoroughfare where he was being mocked as millions were coming into town for Passover. They're walking over the brook Kidron filled with the blood of, the, of this, all the Passover lambs. And then they're walking by the Passover lamb who's hanging on a cross to go in and sacrifice their Passover lamb. Because guys, it all points to Jesus. Amen? 
And whether we sin intentionally or not, we must never take our sin lightly. Point number two. Point number one is reestablishing the sacrifices. Point number two, we'll be done here pretty quick. Righteous judgment against rebellion. You know, the world says your sin's not your fault. The Bible says there's no excuse for sin. So what if we choose not to repent? What if we choose to consciously sin? What if we make a conscious choice, we know it's wrong, and we choose to do it anyway? Look at verse 30. But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native-born or stranger, that one brings reproach upon the Lord. He shall be cut off from among his people, because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. Someone who knows what the word of God says, and the word literally presumptuous to me means to sin with a high hand. It means in a sense to be shaking your fist to God. I'm going to do it. I don't care what you say, God. I'm doing it anyway because I want to do it. And I, know what you're, I know what you say. I know what your word says. I know what the commandments say. I don't care. I made a conscious choice, and this is what I'm going to do. And the result is broken fellowship. Cut off from among the people would be set outside the camp. Lost fellowship. No opportunity to come in and have intimacy with God. Broken fellowship with all those who follow God. You're set apart and you're going to bear your own guilt when you make a conscious choice to live outside of God's will. And too often today, again, I think we, our desire should be, again, we're all sinners. I'm just one beggar leading another beggar to the bread. I don't want to look at myself and be self-righteous at other people. But at the same time, too often we want to excuse away sin and not act like it's not a big deal. When we make a conscious choice to live outside of God's will, we're going to reap the consequences of our sin. You know why this happens? There's no fear of God. Amen? The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of, of wisdom. Which means if you don't fear God... You're stupid. <laughs> Amen? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So no fear of God, no wisdom. Amen? And so it's so foolish to live lives with no fear of God, no awe for God, no reverence for God. And when we do that, we find ourselves in this place where we make a conscious choice to live outside of His will. Now, this next part, we only have about eight minutes left, this next part is a verse that people will bring to me as a pastor and say, okay, this is your loving God? Because look what happens. It says, now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. He's gathering sticks. He's not out slaughtering people. He's not burning houses down. He's not raping and pillaging. He's gathering sticks. I can't tell how many people take me to this verse. Okay, you're loving God? Here we go. I'd love to take it. Atheists know this verse that judge not lest she be judged. Now look what it says. And those found him gathering sticks, brought him to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation, and they put him under guard, because it would not be explained what should be it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must be surely put to death. death. I picked up some sticks. I have to die? Why is that? Let's keep reading and then I'll tell you. This man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So the Lord commanded Moses and all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones and he died. What are you in for, bro? Rape. What about you? Murdered 12 people. What would you do? Picked up some sticks? kind of rough. Let me tell you why what he did was so wrong. God was providing for them. He was dropping manna from the sky. And they were not even together on the Sabbath. It wasn't the fact that he was picking up sticks. It was the fact that he had made a conscious choice to willfully and openly rebel against God's command. Because not only were they not to, they were to take enough on the day before the Sabbath to have enough food to eat for two days, but they were also not to make a fire on the Sabbath. Because what, you're, what he was doing, what, it's a picture of what he's doing is, I don't trust God. I don't believe what God's word says. I don't have to do things God's way. 
And I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to take care of me, and I don't need God. And that's what that's a picture of. Guys, no matter how it may manifest itself, if we get to the place where God has a clear command for our lives, and we shake our fist at Him, and we tell Him, I'm going to do what I want, the way I want, when I want, and I'm not going to obey your word, and, and I really don't care, then the consequences are coming. Amen? I truly believe this. God doesn't send people to hell. We send ourselves when we reject heaven. Amen? We send ourselves when we walk, when he says, I died for you, I love you, I want to have have a relationship with you. No. I died for you, I love you, I want to, no. And this is what happens. People say, no, no, no. We tell God, get away from me. I want nothing to do with you. I'm going to do things my own way. And then in the end, what, what, what is the end result? God gives them what they ask for. This guy picks up sticks. But he violated God's law. He didn't trust God's word. He did his own thing. He sought after his own way. Guys, all, all the cults have this in common. They want to add what Jesus has done. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Amen? And anytime you say Jesus plus baptismal in our, in our baptismal by our pastor, and then you get to have Jesus plus these seven holy sacraments, and then you get to go to heaven. Jesus plus, when, then we make Jesus a liar when he said it's finished. Amen? And this man is doing things his own way. He's shaking his fists at God, and the consequences are real. Here's the real issue. It's not gathering sticks. It's a rebellious heart. The real issue is shaking your fist at God. No matter how it manifests itself, then the consequences come. Final point, remembering the law and the commandments. Look at verse 37 through 41. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassel of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them that you may not follow the harlotry which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined. That you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So these tassels that you see them making a part of their daily clothing was God's way of reminding them that in the midst of a busy life, in the midst of going out day by day and living our lives, there needs to be something that reminds us that there's an authority that we live under. There needs to be something that's to remind us when temptation comes that God has called us to obey Him. They had a tassel that every time they would look down upon it, they were reminded of God's commandments and God's word and God's truth. Now, we live in the new covenant, and we have something so much better than a tassel. You know what we have? Who we have? We have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. He walks with us. He reminds us when we're we're looking at things that we shouldn't, when we're being drawn away to sin. He reminds us of the truth. He convicts us of our sin. He draws us back unto salvation. And these tassels, um, no matter how many idols they saw each day, no matter how many things they saw that could draw them away, it was a reminder that they belonged to the true and living God. There's a blue thread. And the blue thread represents heaven. And it was to remind them to have a heavenly focus, not an earthly one. To constantly keep their eyes off the things of the world and set their eyes on the things above. And again, we don't have, we don't have tassels on our clothes. But we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. A 24-hour day, 7-day week reminder of our deliverance from sin. Of His love and His grace and His mercy and the promise of heaven. You know how you can have joy here? You know my son Johnny right now, again, he's not happy. I'm being real transparent about Two more years in jail, finding out just a few days before you get out. But you know what's bringing him joy? Is having a heavenly focus while he's in jail. Guys, we can have joy here and now if we have an eternal perspective. Did it take away my son's mission field by staying in jail two more years? What's the answer? Can he still represent Jesus there? Amen. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, wherever God has us, We can be used mildly by the Lord if we will allow Him 
to use us. Amen? If we will be tools in the hands of our master. And my prayer is that we be reminded to have that be heavenly minded, to have that eternal perspective. We don't have to be blue if we focus on the blue. Amen? Amen. We don't have to be down if we focus on heaven. Because no matter what happens in this life, God's with me. He loves me. He's faithful. And we're going to heaven. Amen? So, submitting to the authority of God's word. Reestablishing the sacrifices. What's the application for us? Never lose sight of the cross of Calvary. Never let it grow common. Amen? Always be reminded of the greatest act of love in all of human history and how much it costs for us to inherit eternal life. We must never forget. I like to watch that movie, The Passion, about once a year. And it's painful. It wears me out. Anybody else get worn out watching that movie? I watch, I'm exhausted when it's over. I really am. There's some funky stuff in it. But you know what? I love the movie because it reminds me of how much my Savior loves me. And all I can do is weep. Guys, we must be reminded of the cross. We must recognize the righteous judgment comes against rebellion. You know what? We go out, we can live outside of God's will for a period of time. And if the judgment doesn't come, sometimes we can fall into the trap of thinking that God's okay with it. Just remember, God's grace is not God's permission. Amen? Because God hasn't brought immediate and swift judgment, it doesn't mean judgment isn't coming if we don't repent. Lord, help us to not stay in that state, but to be drawn back into the Lord. And we need to remember the law and the commandments. How do we do that? We hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against Him. You know how we know the word? We open up the book and we read it. Amen? Sin can keep you from this book, or this book can keep you from sin. Open it up and read it. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we worship you, Lord. You are indeed a great and awesome God. Thank you for everyone's patience tonight as we went through a lot. But Lord, I pray that we would leave here with our eyes and our minds and our thoughts and our hearts focused on you, your your son's death on the cross, of you seated in heaven upon the throne, of your son interceding on our behalf. May we never take our sin lightly. May we never take it for granted. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and Lord, give us an eternal perspective everywhere we go. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, let's stand and close the worship song.